Okay, today we're going to do uh, a lower back neck school. We're going to teach you about the back. We'll go into a little bit of anatomy, not too boring, and just enough so that you'll be able to understand uh, your condition, what may have caused your condition or common causes, and what we can do about it in order to not only relieve pain, but to prevent your reoccurrences, prevent the pain from coming back or minimize the chances of the pain coming back and the overall condition getting worse because as we all know spinal problems get worse with time they don't get better unless there's proper treatment okay so normal structural curves must be maintained throughout life okay when looking at the spine from the side okay so the person would be facing to the left here okay, there's a C curve in the neck a backward C curve in the mid back and a C curve in the lower back. And those curves must be maintained throughout life, otherwise it's going to cause problems. So that if the neck curve increases or the mid-back curve increases or decreases, that's going to put stress on the joints, on the discs, which are pads that separate the bones and so forth. And here's a good example of it when you see a person walking around with increased curves versus decreased curves. Okay, so th this changes the overall posture. What came first? Is it the postural problem that came first? In other words, bad habits that caused the spinal problem, or did the spinal problem get worse and cause the uh, postural problems? That's very difficult to say. So the vertebrae can move out of place and increase or decrease the curves through adaptation. So when the vertebrae, typically what will happen is the vertebrae will move out of place, and then as he has several vertebrae moving out of place in the same direction, it will change that curve. Okay, so when a bone moves out of place, it can actually pinch the nerve. Here's a healthy nerve, here's a healthy nerve, but that second nerve is being irritated because the hole where the nerve exits from is, um, is smaller when the bone moves out of place. Now, the nerves are simply wires, part of the nervous system. So you have the brain sending off a cable down the spine called the spinal cord, and then the spinal cord uh, gives off spinal nerves that go to various parts of the body, your heart, lungs, kidneys, spleen, muscles, ligaments, all the innervating uh, uh, tissues of the body, as well as uh, sensory information. You have all this information coming from every single part of your body, letting the brain know the status of any organ, every mu any muscle, any tissue. Okay, the brain needs to know what it's doing, how it's doing it, basically its overall status at any time. So the vertebrae are held together with muscles and ligaments. Okay, muscles allow the, uh, the skeletal structure to move. Ligaments hold bones together. So, for example, you won't find a ligament over here, but you will find a ligament over here. In other words, across the joints. So across the elbows, the shoulders, the little joints in your fingers allowing you to bend and move your fingers, uh, your hips, your knees, your ankles. Okay, Each individual vertebra is connected to its vertebra above and below by ligaments. Whereas muscles move them. Okay, so the spine protects the nerves which supply the organ, muscles, and tissues throughout the body. So again, you have the brain, the spinal cord, giving off the spinal nerves going to all the various parts of the body. So taking care of your spine is very important before it's too late. We want to get to children, okay, before they become adults so that they can develop good habits. Just like dentists go into the schools um, to teach the kids how to properly take care of the teeth, well, it's the same thing here. We want to prevent all spinal problems, prevent further degeneration for those people who have degeneration at that point in time. Now, there are a number of rules that we're going to go over. No one likes rules, 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 but we call them rules, things that you should be doing and things that you shouldn't be doing. So rules for sitting. The lower back has to be properly supported. You could either uh, purchase from Costco, has the Samsonite uh, um, uh, little supports that go be cushions that go behind your back or you could just take a, a towel roll it up and put that behind your back as well the feet should be flat on the floor or on a footrest use an armrest to reduce stress to your upper back and neck and also to help you get off the chair so that you could push down on something as you're lifting yourself up when bending from a sitting position be sure not to twist we'll get into that avoid sitting on the floor and 
consciously keep your back straight when getting in and out of a chair, and you push off the armrest, as I just said. So sitting position, obviously this person is not sitting properly. There's a tremendous amount of stress right over here because there's nothing that is supporting that lower back area. When sitting at a computer monitor, the uh, uh, monitor itself should be at eye level. You should, uh, the, foot, the feet should be on the floor. If you don't reach the floor, then put some sort of a support or a footrest uh, so that you're taking pressure off of your knees and hips, which also will translate to taking pressure off the spine. A uh, lower back has to be supported, okay, a little cushion behind the back, and wrist in a neutral position. Why? So that you don't develop carpal tunnel syndrome by keeping your wrist in this position or in this position. Okay, this is an interesting study not done by, I like saying his name, Alf Nachobson. Nachobson. This is back in uh, about the late 70s or so, and he did a study to measure the pressure on the spine in different positions. And shockingly, we found out that the worst position is not standing, it's sitting. Sitting puts the most pressure on your spine, and actually, if you bend forwards in the sitting position, as he's doing right here, that's the absolute worst position. The second worst is standing and bending forwards, like when you brush your teeth, okay, or attempting to lift something. So you don't want to bend in the standing position at the waist. The next uh, position is the sitting position, which is still pretty highly stressful to the spine. Then next is standing, and then finally lying down on your back and on your side. Your side is the best position to, to lie down on. Never cock a phone between your uh, head and shoulder. You know, when we, when we use landline phones, we had a bigger receiver. Now we have cell phones, and it's almost impossible. And you see people, they're cocking their head, and then they're lifting up their shoulder, and they're crimping their neck in order to hold the phone in place. The worst thing you could do. First of all, you don't want the phone too close to your brain because of the fact that we don't know that it's definitely true, but there's a chance it's electromagnetic waves. It could have some effect on the brain, possibly even causing cancer. We don't know that. It's very rare that I hold the phone to my ear. I like to use the Bluetooth uh, uh, headsets, uh, which is really the best thing for you, or at least uh, as long as you're not in the public library or in a public place, use the, um, use the speakerphone portion of your phone. So, Basically, the best thing to do, again, is some sort of a Bluetooth uh, or a wired uh, headrest, headset. Sleeping, um, sleeping, we sleep about a third of our lives. Hopefully, you get eight hours of sleep, 24 hours in a day, about a third. So, therefore, you want to sleep in a good position and on a good supportive mattress. Okay, so as far as sleeping is concerned, the improper way to sleep would be on your stomach is the worst position. She's sleeping on her back here, okay, which is fine, except there's no support of her back or her knees. So the best thing to do is either to take a rolled up towel, put it underneath the back or underneath the uh, knees. She's got one, two, three pillows here, okay, which puts too much pressure on the neck. You want to get a cervical pillow. A cervical pillow will support the space between your neck and the body lying on your side. Again, now she's got a cervical pillow. It supports her face, and head, and neck so that there's a nice cushion between the face and the, and the bed so the head is kept in a neutral position rather than laterally flexed to one side or the other, and a pillow between the knees. Second best position on your back, again, pillow underneath your knees or underneath your lower back, and a cervical pillow underneath the neck. Never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, ever, ever, never, ever, never, never, ever, never. You know what I'm trying to say? Never sleep on your stomach, okay? Worst position for your spine. It increases the curves, puts more pressure on the discs and on the facet joints, but it also allows your organs to hang down and put stress on your organs. You don't want to do that, in other words. Okay? Never lie on a couch. Uh, couches are not made for human beings. They're made for good uh, housekeeping magazine just to look good. Um, even sitting on a couch is not the best thing for you. But don't lie on a couch. Your head is cocked up. It's, there's no support of your back. 
And people, you know, they say, oh, but it feels good. Well, you know what? Jumping out of a plane without a parachute feels good also until you hit bottom. Sideline position, both knees bent in a semi-fetal position, pillow between the knees, arms down, they're not headrest, and a cervical pillow to support the neck. Okay, when getting up from a, uh, from a lying down position, when you're lying on your back or on your side, you always want to move to the sideline position. Then if you move to the sideline position, in the semi-fetal position, you bring your knees towards the edge of the, of the bed, and then you push up with your arms. So basically, you're keeping your back straight rather than just rolling out of bed any old way. And if you're a patient, I've taught you that getting up from uh, my your treatment tables, uh, how to properly get up from a, a lying down position when you're lying on your stomach on my tables. You want to bend your knees. Okay, anytime you bend down, you always want to bend at the knees rather than at the back. Yes, there are times where you can't get close to an object for whatever reason, and therefore, you have, to, um, you have to bend at the waist, but you can bend at the knees. Like, for example, if you're getting something out of the oven, you pull open the oven door, so now you have the hot oven door between you and the oven. So, therefore, bend the knees and then bend forwards a little bit. You don't have to bend forwards at the waist as much if you're bending your knees. So, you always want to keep the back straight. Okay, worst position to lift. I just saw a FedEx driver, and I just said to her, you're lifting wrong. First of all, she should be wearing a belt to support herself, a lower back support. And you never want to lift like this because look, all the pressure is right over here on the back. All right, we don't have to deal with snow. I, I made this slide when I was uh, living in New York and I was teaching people how to shovel snow properly. But in any case, you never want to bend at the waist. You always want to bend at the knees and, and preferably use a bent shovel. We don't have to deal with snow here, but people do garden and they do a lot of digging and so forth. So you want to do it properly. Okay, again, never lift at the waist. Even when you are working out, lifting weights, you always want to lift at the knees. Keeping the back straight anytime you're lifting. Plan your lift, nose between the toes. Nose between the toes, that means that you're facing your object. Okay, you don't want to lift to the side because then you're twisting your spine. Twisting your spine is like taking sandpaper to your discs. You don't want to do that. Yeah, you'll get away with it many, many times over the years, but after a while, it's suddenly going to hit you. It's going to affect the nerves because there's going to be enough degeneration. So bend your knees, lift with your legs, set the abdomen, in other words, tighten the abdomen, know the weight of your load. If the load is heavier than you think, you're going to hurt yourself because you're going to think, oh, this is light, and then suddenly, what's going to happen? You're going to freeze up and your back is going to go into spasm. Keep the load close to your body, always close to your body. You never want to lift away from your body. If you lift away from your body, you're talking about 10 times the amount of pressure on your lower back. So if the object weighs 50 pounds and you're lifting it away from your body at the waist, therefore you're putting 500 pounds of stress on that poor lower back area. Pivot, don't twist. So if I'm going to lift something over here and I'm going to put it on a shelf over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bend down at the, at the uh, knees, I'm going to lift straight up, and then I'm going to pivot. I'm pivoting, which you can't see, on the balls of my feet in order to turn and face the shelf where I'm putting the heavy object. Whether you should push or pull, you always want to push. Get behind the object and use your legs and your weight uh, in order to push an object. And you also want to know how that object uh, moves on the floor. If it's on wheels, it's going to roll nicely. If it's not on wheels and you have metal on concrete, well then what are you talking about? Or wood on concrete, there's going to be a lot of friction, so therefore it's going to add to the weight of the load and make it more difficult for you and increase the chances of getting hurt. Stretching. Stretching is very important and when you're ready for stretching exercises, I will give them to you. Uh, but stretching helps to relax muscles, it increases blood flow, increases circulation. Um, so it's really important as part of your everyday exercise program as a preventive measure or as part of rehab from an injury. So why stretch? It reduces muscle tension and relaxes you. As I said, it increases coordination and range of motion, prevents muscle injuries, promotes circulation and warms up the muscles. Okay, because if you have blood, uh, increased blood going to a muscle, blood is bringing in warmth. Okay, it's your body temperature. 
So therefore, it's going to help to warm up the muscle. It feels good, and it's good for rehab from an injury. When to stretch in the morning, in the evening, uh, at work, after sitting or standing for a long time, you want to stretch every 20 minutes. Never sit for more than 20 minutes. Okay, you always want to stand up and stretch a bit. And then anytime you feel stretched, stri stiff. So in other words, you can never stretch too much. Okay, you can overstretch in terms of the stretch itself, but in terms of frequency, you could stretch 20 times a day if you want. Rules for proper stretching, a relaxed and sustained stretch, no bouncing, do not stretch to the point of pain, uh, perform several times a day, there's no limit, and you hold for anywhere between 10 and 30 seconds. You start off with 10 seconds and then you move up to 30 seconds. Stupid excuses, yeah, I was in a hurry, patient will come in and they'll say, boy, I did something stupid yesterday. They know it themselves. I was in a hurry, I, there was nobody around to ask, okay, so you shouldn't do it if there's no one around to ask. Uh, if it's too heavy for you, I was too embarrassed to ask, I didn't think, get help. Okay, that's the best advice I can give you. Discs are small circular cushions between the vertebrae and the spine. They're uh, very compressible. The thing about discs and the reason why I spend so much time with discs and I specialize in disc problems is because discs are, the most, are one of the most serious things that can happen to your spine. Uh, when I say damaged disc, I should say, or disc pathology is one of the worst things that could happen to your spine. Uh, so therefore, I go over it in detail. The disc consists of two parts, a nucleus, which is a jelly or gelatinous a type of substance similar to toothpaste, and it's surrounded by cartilage, cartilage fibers, in order to protect that um, nucleus. Okay, here you can see the nucleus, you can see the cartilage. Um, this is the spinal cord. This is an aerial view, so we're looking down on one segment of the spine. So you can see the spinal cord right in the middle, and the spinal cord gives off a nerve going to the left and going to the right to innervate the left side of the body and the right side of the body. So it consists of two parts very similar to a jelly donut, okay? And the jelly is called the nucleus and the cartilage is the outside. As long as the discs are healthy, the chances of herniation are slim. But if the discs are not healthy, if they become damaged, then there's a greater chance uh, that stress, any type of stress, will cause a bulging disc, a herniated disc, and so forth. The, the, Degeneration is permanent when it happens. Okay, we can't regenerate discs, and again, if you're a patient, I've explained that to you already. The best we could do is keep your disc the way it is, prevent it from degenerating anymore. Okay, and that's a key point. So the degeneration is permanent, and it causes pain in two ways. It can irritate the small nerves called the sinovertebral nerves that, uh, that innervate the outside portion of the disc, and when, when a disc uh, tears or degenerates, it can irritate that nerve and that can cause pain. And it also can irritate the spinal nerve, which exits the spine from the spinal cord. So you have a tipping of the vertebra, it causes degeneration of the disc, and then the disc bulges back. And it, in addition to the vertebra, it could put pressure on the nerve. And wherever the nerve goes to, is going to cause symptoms. Pain, tingling, numbness, warm sensation, cold sensation, burning sensation. And finally, muscle weakness. The, the weakness stage is a bad stage okay, to be in because then we know that there's a lot of damage to the nerves at that point. As the degenerative process continues, the discs get drier, thinner, brittle, and more likely to get worse in, with time. This is a side view, again, this is an MRI side view of the spine, and you see how this disc is not too bad, but look how thin that disc is. It's also very dark. And dark on an MRI is not a good sign. That means that there's not, there's, there, aren't, there isn't any water content in the disc. Herniated disc, I said before, is similar to a jelly donut. You squeeze the, uh, the donut and the gel oozes out through the dough. And that's what happens with a herniated disc. The nucleus can now put pressure on the spinal nerve. So hopefully you could see this. Here's the, the uh, nucleus. And it is... Uh, moving outwards through tears in the annular fibers and therefore it's moved out enough where it's pressing on the spinal nerve. 
So whatever parts of the body the nerve supplies is going to be affected. If the nerve is coming out of the neck, going into the head, it can cause headaches. If it goes to the sinuses, it can cause sinus problems. If that nerve is coming out of the neck and going into the shoulder and down the arm, into the fingers, it can cause pain, tingling, numbness in those areas as well. If it comes out of the lower back, uh, and the nerve, the sciatic nerve is affected, which is a nerve that goes into the buttock and down the leg. It can cause pain, tingling, numbness down the leg. It can cause urinary problems because the same nerves that supply the leg go into the bladder and it also can, it, it goes into the colon, so it can cause a constipation, diarrhea, that sort of thing as well. So it can cause a variety of organic problems, in other words, with the organs, and somatic problems with the rest of the body the muscles, ligaments, and so forth. So a lumbar herniated disc can cause lower back pain that radiates into the buttock and down the leg. Uh, it's referred to as sciatica, which is pain along the course of the sciatic nerve. Just saying, oh yeah, I have sciatica, that's not a diagnosis. That's like saying I have a headache. What's causing it? All sciatica means is pain along the sciatic nerve. So when you go to a doctor, especially a primary care physician, not to criticize them, but this is not their specialty. They'll say, oh, you have sciatica. Okay, you just basically said I have pain in the lower back going down the leg, and the doctor translated that into a more technical term called sciatica. It's not a diagnosis. It doesn't tell you the cause. Herniated discs are most common in the lower spine, but also occur in the neck, as I said. Cervical herniated disc causes neck pain that can radiate into the shoulder and down the arms and so forth. So now, as far as treatment is concerned, okay, I have two great treatments for herniated discs that most other doctors do not do. Uh, Cox distraction and VAXD or vertebral axial decompression. So the ultimate goal of treatment should be to retract the nucleus, pull that nucleus back into place. Here's the problem. You ever squeeze out too much toothpaste from a tube? Okay, so now you have all that toothpaste that came out. How do you get it back in the tube? Pretty challenging, huh? All right, you have to set up a vacuum in that tube, which, of course, we don't have a way of doing. So we found a way to, uh, to create a vacuum in your disc to suck the disc back into its proper position. Okay, and that's what chiropractic does, or at least I should say, non-conventional or the more traditional type of chiropractic just handles the bones, putting the vertebrae back in place, correcting subluxations. It does take pressure off the spine. However, we need to take the pressure off the discs as well. And there are two great techniques that, I, like I said, I do called Cox distraction and vertebral axial decompression. Now, other options, and we'll get into those in a couple of minutes, other options, surgery, and then you have a lot of risks when it comes to surgery. And there are some people that think, oh, I'll just undergo a surgery and I'll be fine. That's not the way it works. There are different types of surgery. There's a discectomy where they clip off a piece of the disc that is affecting the nerve. Nothing is stopping the rest of the disc from reherniating, and that's why very often people have to go back for second surgeries, third surgeries, and also... If the, if, uh, if the doctor happens to, or the surgeon happens to fuse the bones together, then it puts more pressure on the other joints as well, and then they can degenerate. So that's why you may know people who had, let's say, L5-S1 fused, and then they have to go back for fusion of L4-L5, and then L3-L4. I've seen six, seven, eight fusions. But there's risks of anesthesia. Anytime you're under anesthesia, even though it's slim, but it still happens. Infection does happen, bleeding, uh, nerve disruption, instability, most serious side effect, increased risk of additional surgery. Okay, as I mentioned before, interference with dynamic functional compensation of the lower back. And this was a study that was done uh, back in um, about 2002 or so, uh, Nagashevsky and Nagashevsky, and they found that there were functional uh, compensations as a result of disc surgery causing other problems throughout the spine. So in surgery, again, you have the, uh, the uh, nucleus, the nucleus is herniating, so, and it's pressing on the spinal nerve right over here, so they remove this portion in a discectomy, okay, meaning it's remo they remove part of the disc, okay, or they can remove the entire disc and then fuse the bones together. So we have two types of herniated disc treatments, as I mentioned. VAXD is the first one. VAXD, vertebral axial decompression, is the proven treatment that decompresses the lumbar spine. Decompresses. Instead of compressing, it does the opposite. So it sets up that vacuum effect on the disc, 
person lies down on a Vax D table. Um, don't confuse this with traction. It is not traction. And the technical physical uh, differences, okay, and it does involve no, the knowledge of physics, okay, there is a, a logarithmic increase in or decrease in pressure, which is what Vax D does, versus linear when it comes to traction. And in linear, it can cause spasm of muscles. And people have told me, oh, God, you know, I, I had traction, and as soon as I went, into, uh, went on the traction table, my back went into spasm. I'm never doing that again. But that's a lot different because that's linear versus logarithmic type of distraction. And so what happens is it reduces the pressure in the disc from a plus 200 millimeters of mercury, meaning it pushes outwards, to minus 150. Minus negative pressure, it sets up a vacuum and literally sucks that disc back in. So as we distract the vertebrae, okay, we're applying pressure, we're pulling over here, pulling over here. What happens is it increases the size of the disc and therefore it reduces the pressure in the disc and fluids, blood, oxygen, nutrients start to go into the disc and allow for, for some healing, not a lot of healing, but some healing to take place within the disc and it also allows for retraction of that nucleus off of the nerve. The average total cost of Vax-D is about one-tenth the cost of surgery. The patient doesn't lose time from work in most cases and it has a 71% success rate. 71% is great compared to risks of other types of treatments means that 7 out of 10 people get better with Vax-D. Yes, there are 29% who don't get better, but at least that 29% don't get worse. Okay, as in other types of treatments, specifically surgery, there's a decent chance that they get worse. On average, more than 70% return to work. Here's a great MRI pre and post. You had a patient here all these discs are white, they're uh, uh, hydrated very well. This one is degenerated, and look, it's shifted backwards, and it's pressing on the neural structures, okay, on the nerves. Here's uh, after Vax-D, you can see here's the same disc, and it's caused retraction of that nucleus off of the neural structures. So the reason Vax-D works is that it fools the muscles with the logarithmic approach so that they don't contract because when you pull on a muscle, it will automatically respond by contracting. We don't want that to happen here in order to get the pressure uh, to reduce in the discs. Four-year follow-up stu study, improvement of the visual analog scale, meaning that 10 scale that I always drive patients crazy because the insurance companies want to know, specifically Medicare and the government. So therefore, uh, people come in, they have pain of 8 or 9. The average person, that pain level was reduced to 3.41. And even after Vax-D, the disc continued to heal, and it went down to 1.47 four years later. 70% were still working at four years, and 86% were working or retired without lower back pain. Without pain, 86%. Therefore, rarely a need to retreat the Vax-D patient. I have had several patients who, have, who did things, uh, silly things, and they re-injured themselves, and we had to do Vax-D again. Continues to have positive effects on the disc long after the treatment is completed. The disc continues to heal for three months, and the nerve continues to heal after up to three years. Okay, so that's an important thing to consider. Now, what causes the disc to herniate in the first place, degenerate in the first place? The most common reason is a subluxation, and that's what conventional chiropractors deal with. Okay, subluxations, which I do as well, but I specifically uh, address the disc problem. So you have the first bone, the third, and the fourth are in their proper alignment. The second bone is shifted backwards and downwards. Here's a healthy nerve. Here's a healthy nerve, but look at that nerve. It's a scrawny nerve. It's, it's atrophied because of the pressure as a result of that nerve, that hole, um, diminishing in size. Here's the discs. Here are the discs, I should say. Here's a healthy disc. Here's a healthy disc. But you can see how degenerated that disc is. After Vax-D, there's maximum correction of the disc, and then the ultimate uh, cause of the disc uh, condition needs to continue to be addressed. So subluxations have to be corrected, and that's where our chiropractic adjustments come in, and I do something called Cox distraction. So we need to continue to take the pressure off the discs 
otherwise the disc will continue to degenerate. And that's what Cox Distraction does. By using my hands at a special table, I can take the pressure off the disc. And some of you have undergone Cox Distraction and are quite familiar with it. So the bottom line is this. Prevention. If you didn't brush your teeth, okay, for 25 years, what do you think is going to happen? Okay, you're not going to have any teeth left. They're going to degenerate and probably fall out. Well, unfortunately, most people don't take care of their spines. And when they don't take care of their spines, and then suddenly they're age 35, 40, 50, 60, they suddenly develop problems. They say, I don't understand how I developed these problems. Well, you never took care of them in the first place. And it's true. There's a lack of education. That's what I've tried to change. I used to go into the schools back in New York and teach the kids what to do, how to take care of their spines. Okay, it's so important. The spine is no different than your teeth. You just don't see it without taking imaging pictures of it. And you do develop spinal decay just like you develop teeth or oral decay. Here's a normal spine, here's a spine that's degenerating, and then here's a spine that's fused together because of all the degeneration over the years. Chiropractic health program, there's three phases of care. There's relief care in order to relieve the symptoms, which is very important to people, and I understand that. I want to help them as fast as I can, and usually within a few, few weeks, they do get relief of the symptoms. Then we start corrective or rehabilitative care, where we work on getting the bones into place and getting them to stay in place for longer and longer periods of time. And then finally, maintenance care to maintain it so it doesn't continue to happen again. You know, people will say, well, gee, do I have to go the rest of my life? No, you don't have to go the rest of your life. You only have to go for as long as you want to be healthy, for as long as you want to maintain good neurological health and good uh, spinal health. Once you decide you don't want that anymore, then you stop. I mean, we're talking about once every few weeks, sometimes once a week, sometimes once a month, depending on each individual patient. However, just think about it. How long do you want to have good teeth? You want to take care of your teeth, you take care of them every day, and then you go for every six months or yearly appointments in order for them to get rid of the plaque uh, so that it doesn't cause more problems. Well, it's the same thing in chiropractic. I'll give you another example that a patient named Bernie told me years ago, probably 25 years ago, he came up with a great example. He says, I don't understand why people would have a problem with preventive care. He says they, t they have high blood pressure, they take high blood pressure medication. Well, if they stop taking the medication, what's going to happen? Your blood pressure is going to increase. So I tell them, you take the, the blood pressure medication for as long as you don't want high blood pressure. Once you decide you want to have high blood pressure, stop taking the medication. I mean, that's really the bottom line. Okay, it's very similar here. So that is really preventive care, just like this is preventive care. In that case, you're trying to prevent a stroke or a heart attack. In this case, we're trying to prevent spinal decay and further problems. All right, well, just as children are taught good oral health habits, they need to be taught good spinal habits as well. So in other words, share the information. I hope you found this informative. And if you're thinking about pa becoming a patient, I look forward to meeting you. Uh, if you are a patient, I will see you on your next visit. And if this is online, I will see you on the next video. Thanks again.